Hey friends, it's Awkwardly Random with Cynthia and Michelle, where we talk about random topics. Anything and everything awkward is on the table, so let's dive right in. Hey everybody! Hi, welcome back to Awkwardly Random with Cynthia and Michelle. Woo! We're bringing yet another episode, y'all. Yes. Um, YouTube and podcast. Um, I'm personally excited about today's Me episode. Too. I'm so excited. We have another great guest joining us. Yeah. I feel like Michelle, you probably agree with this, but I feel like overall we've had some pretty good guests. Yeah. So it's always really cool yep. to have, you know, it's really cool to have someone else join us and talk with us. Mm-hmm. Um, so this guest I'm excited to talk about with like some real, real shit. We're going to talk about a lot of real stuff and, yep. and relatable things. That's what we try to do. Mm-hmm. Um, many within the, the Madison community, you probably know her. Uh, mm-hmm. She's done a lot for the community, particularly communities of color in Madison. Mm-hmm. Um, she's kind-hearted, genuine. She's got some musical talent, y'all. She can dance <laughs> for real. <laughs> Multifaceted for real. Just really good person overall. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, hi, Maricela. Hello. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you <laughs> for being on. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited. Yeah. Thank you for taking your time out of your day. Mm-hmm. It is the evening. It's it's getting later in the day. Yeah. So we appreciate you. You know, you probably mm-hmm. worked today and had your mm-hmm. stuff to do. So mm-hmm. again, we appreciate you being here and talk, yes. talking with us today and sharing yep. your space with us. See, I'm excited to see y'all. It's always fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how do we all know each other? Do you remember how y'all met? Y- yeah. Oh my, it's so funny, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh what happened do you want to say it Michelle or you want me to say it you can say it you can say it okay Go so ahead. first but it, um Maricela Gomez right okay mm-hmm. um okay you want to say how we met because I think Maricela and I first met and then through you know our friendship and my sister's friendship you met Cynthia Cynthia um, mm-hmm. but how Maricela and I met was through the Madison, like Mecha organizing community there, but we didn't actually like get to know each other until we went on a road trip. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think, I think that's when I vividly remember like who you were and like, you know, Maricela and I don't know if you want to explain it, uh, but we were going to, um, with the uh, Immokalee workers from Florida. Mm-hmm. They were having their annual um, event, but it was in Ohio. And so basically uh, campaigning for Wendy's to join the fair food program um, in terms of them signing on to it and basically paying their workers a penny more per pound of what they picked on the field. And then also um, basically saying that they would advocate for fair treatment and like uh, no sexual misconduct on, like in the work field. So that that's the background, but you can give more of like how we met. Yeah, I remember that. And I think throughout the road trip, cuando vimos, like we ate like the ribs and everything. We're just in the car talking. And I think I met like several other people from Mecha, but I didn't feel that connection until that road trip because after the protest and everything and we came back mm-hmm. and you know we had like that diarrhea moments where like I told no CEO like um oh, no. food poisoning because of the burritos <laughs> and yeah. we were all trying to figure out what we ate and it was the burgers that we ate at that restaurant um but we had like a compañera who didn't eat um a burger there so we're like it has to be the burritos and then we found out that like other buses and other places coming from New York and DC also mm-hmm. had food poisoning. Oh so gosh. that was, I guess that was my favorite, not my favorite, but like the most vivid memory that I have. Yeah, same. What and a nice then- bonding moment. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to yeah, shit in one bathroom at the real. gas station. Like, so oh, intimate. It was like a, was it an eight hour um drive yeah, that ended up turning into a 16 hour drive yeah, it, it took forever because we had to stop so many times yeah. because everybody had Ooh, to go to the y'all bathroom. doubled the time <laughs> yeah and it was because it started with one or two three people and then eventually two one more added and then two more oh. and eventually the whole van had to go except one person mm-hmm. and she got it until she got home but it was just interesting and I know during the whole como 
protesta and everything. Estamos en el baño taking selfies, and mm -hmm. that's how nice. we started to bond as well. Yeah. And so I have those pictures, and then it, it shows up every year, and I remember that yeah. experience, my first yeah. protest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I remember I took that picture of you with the flag. Yes. That's when I started getting oh, into I've photography. And I was just yeah. trying to document a lot of things. And I just thought it was very beautiful and powerful, just like how yeah. you can capture things. And that's when I was like, and I, that's one of my favorite pictures of you that I've ever taken. Uh, yeah. And then my, my friend Rodrigo, he actually um, did a painting of it. Como oh, he really? Liked it. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I bought it from him. Yeah. So it was Ooh, really nice. I didn't know. Yo, you I need to show it to yes. us. Yeah. Oh, I'll send it to you. Us, and then we can post it on our Instagram. Yeah. <gasps> yes. Yeah. yeah okay yeah we'd love to share it yes. dang mm -hmm. y'all have a good story yeah. <laughs> yeah what a cool story i think yeah like you said michelle i met you maricela through i think it was through michelle or through jackie or through both of them mm -hmm. um, I think both. but i remember we didn't really hang out much and I, I but i do remember going out one time dancing or something and i was like dang this girl could really dance <laughs> you got skills yeah. girl we went to dance like cumbia, bachata, todo eso, and you really, you actually taught me some of those, like, how to actually move my hips a little bit more, because I'm really, like, tiesa when it comes to uh -huh. dancing, I'm really my hips, <laughs> so you taught me that, um, but I feel like recently we connected because, we reconnected because you posted a video on your Instagram story of you playing el bajo, the bass, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh my god, that's so cool, I, I don't know very many people that play the bass, and especially women and like I was like okay this yeah. is cool I gotta message her and then I feel like from there we started talking more and it was really cool to connect on that level mm -hmm. um, but yeah I also remember us um going to play tennis I yes. think I actually got into tennis for the yeah oh okay yeah uh, we, I think we went to I think it was a gem it yeah. was Karina oh, yeah. Michelle you and I and then we went there too. Yes. Yeah. In Karina. And then we went to your house. Uh, to it was when we were at the red house, or, right? I think so. We went. We were swimming and everything. And Michelle and Jackie were teaching me how to swim because I don't know how to swim. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, it was at your mom's like apartment, I, wasn't it? <gasps> oh I my gosh! So. Yes, the outdoor. Yeah, the outdoor mm -hmm. pool. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. I, yeah. That was I, fun. I, yeah. Did I remember really until you explained that? <laughs> Yeah, that was a yeah. good time. That was a good mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Wow, nice. Um, so before we get into our topics of conversation today, um <laughs> was wondering if you would like to like tell us a little bit about yourself, tell the listeners about yourself, anything that you want to share, mm -hmm. your upbringing, what you like to do for fun, what are you working on right now? Anything that you want to share about yourself, mm -hmm. go for it. Okay. Um, so my name is Maricela. Um, I was born in Long Beach, California, pero a los 10 años, my parents took us to, um, Oaxaca in un pueblo de, se llama San Juan Quiotepec, and I grew up there six years, y a de ahí, 2010, my parents brought us to Wisconsin, so I've been here for like 10 years, yeah, ya llevo 10 años, um, we speak Chinanteco, um, es una, un lenguaje que se habla en la comunidad. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, a, I'm a daughter, I'm a nieta, I'm a sister, I'm a, officially a tía. Ooh, um, yeah, I'm excited to have that transition. And um, yeah, I, I like to play sports I like to play soccer I like to play basketball with my dad um I like to recently I'm getting into music so I'm learning the bass right now I'm practicing la jarana that I've been I picked up in college and um yeah that's pretty much what I've been doing yeah nice that is so cool. I know I, you know when you do so much and also <laughs> I didn't know you were born in California so yeah, was I, I either yeah that's mm -hmm. so cool yeah. and then like I kind of I kind of don't go with like oh I'm from Cali because I only remember it until like I was 10 so I'm like yeah. do I really relate to it so yeah do you but ever go back it. like tienes familia ahí I'm, I'm sí, está... you do. yeah todos mis tíos mis oh. tías mis primos so yeah so ustedes son los únicos aquí en, en Wisconsin or do you have other family here too 
Um, from my, mi familia nuclear somos los únicos y oh. tenemos mi primo que por él venimos acá. Él está en uh -huh. Milwaukee right now. Oh, ok. Y de ahí hay como paisanos que son también del pueblo que right. conocemos oh. que son de acá. So, like, it doesn't, now it doesn't feel that como lonely porque yeah, sure. han migrado por acá. So, it kind of feels nice to have them around. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask what was the decision of coming to Wisconsin instead of going back to California? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I remember we went in Pueblo and we were like 16 Mar years Maricela, right? And we're out there with our friends having fun. And one day out of the blue, my parents are like, oh, we're like, ya que acabaron um, la secundaria y queremos que pre terminen la preparatoria en Estados Unidos porque, like, you know, mm -hmm. mejor educación y no sé qué. Um, and I was like, okay. And my dad was like, hablé con tu tío. And, you know, like, California, like, how my parents associate California as, like, you know, a lot of gangs, a lot of, like, you mm -hmm. know, stuff that was going on. The reason we left California. And so my parents were afraid that if we were to go back to California, we would probably end up involved again in those things mm. so then they were like sabes que mejor mi primo estaba en, en ese entonces estaba acá and he was like tío venganse por acá acá está la he talked about UW Madison muy buena escuela like la comunidad está bien no hay tanto como pandillas y no sé qué so that for my parents was like oh a perfect place to raise your children right so they decided to come to Wisconsin and we had no say with it like nomás nos dijeron agarren sus cosas preparen sus cosas nos vamos a ir a Wisconsin And all of us were like, Wisconsin. Where's that? <laughs> yeah, and then I had What's to look at the there? map. And, and I was like, all the way over there? It's like, está como cerca de Canadá, right? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to Canada. And like, I was telling my friends in Mexico, like, me voy a Canadá, está cerca por acá. And my friends were like, okay. And este, but yeah, and then my dad would tell us, um, just to mess with us. He was like, oh, no hay nada, ya no como en el pueblo se acostumbra que hay fiestas mm. so Semana Santa, so estamos ahí todos en las fiestas, and my dad was like ahí no hay fiestas, no hay nada pura granja, like all cows pura and everything, granja. that's it yeah, he's like, that's it, and I was just like I don't want to go there, like that doesn't sound fun for me, mm -hmm. and but yeah, we had no say, so aquí estamos yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to ask you quickly how was it for you when you first arrived to Wisconsin you know like your dad told you all these things and then so you, you probably had this picture in your head already de cómo iba a estar and mm -hmm. then when you arrived what was your like what was your reaction or what did you feel honestly porque en, el, en México en el pueblo se acostumbra cuando sales del pueblo y vas a la ciudad ves uh -huh. a todos Toros en el camino, like eating grass and just free. Right. I, <laughs> I thought that Wisconsin was gonna have a, a where I was gonna arrive and I was gonna see a bunch of cows roaming around, you know, like all free and wild. <laughs> um, which was not the case. Cuando llegamos, de, we stopped first at California to like entregar unos pedidos, mm -hmm. and then we ended up going to, um, to Wisconsin, and we ended up arriving to Madison. Um, so when we were We were at the airport. I remember the feeling that it was too small. And I was like, oh, this, this was quick. This was fast. And we're sitting there. And my cousin comes to pick us up. And he looks at us. It's almost safe, right? He llega. And he was like, whoa. And he had like a little four-door car. And we had like tres, cuatro, cinco maletas. And like, oh, ready to go. And he was like, he's like, I'm going to have to make two or three trips. And so ahorita regreso por ustedes. So he would like go. And when he came for us at the end, I remember it was like around September, so todo estaba verde todavía, and it was so pretty. I right. thought it was pretty. I was like, oh, está bonito. And then I saw the freeway, and then I saw the streets, and I was like, where is the cows? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, where are the cows? In my head, I was like, y, los, y las vacas? And but it was really interesting. <laughs> but I thought it was pretty. It was really green. And I'm used to, like, the whole greenery thing and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. You know, Sorry, legit, that's what a lot of my family, porque también tengo familia en, en California, that's what they think of Wisconsin. They think uh -huh. that it's just farm and like cows and like everything is farmland. And then you come here and it's like, it's not, I mean, it's not a big city también, uh, yeah. but it's also not just like farmland. So that's hilarious. Mm -hmm. I'm like, where's the vacas? I know, right? I'm like, I don't hear no boom. <laughs> Well, that is a whole bunch of fake cows all over like the city. If you've seen them, like downtown, oh, yeah. all the different. I was cows. like fake cows, <laughs> like statues, statues. Um, 
That's so funny. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah. Marisela, just like for fun, um, just like an interesting question, I, I think, because I am a big person who loves hair. Like I love mm-hmm. my hair. I take care of my hair, but also like I have done so much to my hair. Like I've, I've gotten like two perms before I've colored my hair so many times right now. It's like my, this is my natural color, but I, over the years, I noticed que tu también, like you've done a lot to your hair. Um, and I never actually asked you ever personally, like, oh, like why the big transformation? Like for instance, I know, like, um, I don't know if it was this year or last year, like you had like really, um, like some cool bangs and like short oh, dark yeah. hair. That was a cool <laughs> look. Like you yeah. look good in that. And then también antes, I remember that you like, um, when I first met you, you had long hair. I mean, you still have long hair now. You had really long hair. And then I think, um, I don't know how many years afterwards, like you cut it really short and I thought you looked good too. And I never got to ask you, like you have gone through all these hair transformations. Is there a reason why? Or like, sometimes I just do it for fun and there is no reason. Back, back in the day, like in 2004, 2005, there was a lot of racism between like indigenous communities. Mm-hmm. And people don't, now it's like, there's a lot of like, como, power and reclaiming right which is beautiful yeah. pero antes you know to be indigenous was something that like like a lot of people were not as proud as we are right now mm-hmm. and so it was like I felt that like having straight hair would, was giving me like, like a lot of like you know those like features of like nos vemos muy india si da, 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 kind of mm-hmm. like mentality so when I had the curly hair it gave me that like ambiguity like I did I felt like different and mm. and that is and it's sad to think about it that way too when I reflect about it because it's just like it's kind of fucked up that we have we were like put that mentality on mm-hmm, in yeah. order to like because when we would go to the city we were like nos miraban like really weird when it was con mi abuelita and stuff like yeah. that so it was really um frustrating yeah, yeah. Those beauty standards it. yeah exactly and um so when I had that curly hair, um, I actually liked como se miraba, like super rizado, super pretty. And I just, I mean, me quedé con eso por un ratito cuando estaba en la escuela. And I just felt like I look really cute, like long curly mm-hmm. hair. And it's just like, yeah, I same. just felt really cute. And, yeah. and it was, and I didn't think about it too much, just like um, yeah. other things, but I was like, really cute. Yeah. And then de ahí me fui pensando más como en la universidad de empezar a aprender sobre you know, el sexismo y todo eso, mm. and then, like, las mujeres yeah. se ven bonitas con cabello largo, que una yeah. mujer se así, y creo que como, yo siempre he sido como la oveja negra de la familia, and I was, llegó un momento, I think I was just mad, I was, like, processing a lot of stuff, and I was just, like, ¿sabes qué? Me voy a cortar el cabello. Mm-hmm. And I don't, like, salí de la escuela, y me fui a, my friend was doing um, cosmetology and MTC, yeah. and I went there, and I was, like, cut my hair like practice you she needed someone to practice and I was like here I am cut my hair you just made the decision like Like you just was like oh I'm gonna do this like you didn't tell anybody I'm hella impulsive yeah I'm impulsive so I'm just like when se mete una idea se me mete and I'm like yeah did you actually think about it though like were you like like it was it just like I'm just gonna do it fuck it type of thing or was it like (laughs) like did you think about it it was just like I'm just gonna do it yeah I'm just gonna do it fuck it and that's cool though I biked there and I was like, yeah, and I was like, me lo corto. And then I was like, hey, can you do like the undercut? And so then we went from like, so. corto to undercut. And then I saw this picture of like, I think her name is Ruby, Ruby, Ruby Rose, Ruby Rose. Mm-hmm. And I really <laughs> love her hair. Her hair is, yeah, she has yeah. yes. really nice, nice hair. All her styles, yeah. Yes. I was just like, I love that style. I was just like, I'm in it. I love it. So then I was like, you know what? I'm already, I already have my hair short. I can say So then I did so the fuck whole it. thing. Yeah. yeah. And then I was like, okay, 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 whatever. And so, yeah, yeah, it does. It does grow. Yeah. But it is expensive. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was telling you that like, cuando te lo cortas corto, and porque siento que me crece rápido el cabello también, yeah. I had to like, like go every week or every other oh, week. Yeah. So that was like, I think it was like 12 plus tips. So I said, I think I'm almost right away. So yeah. like, right, it was, right. It was um, maintenance. It was, like, you got a budget mm-hmm. for it. 
Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, you good though. You look yeah, good. Yeah, you could pull off anything. Yeah, pretty much. Thank you. Yeah, all your hair styled like yeah. they. Yeah, you look so good in all of them, yeah. and you look good with the long <laughs> hair. You look good, yeah, with the short hair, all of it. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you what you felt like. Isn't this in a moment when she started to cut your hair? Because you talked about how you know those standards of there was this expectation that women had to have this long, beautiful hair, whatever that mm -hmm. means, right? And then you were like, that makes me feel angry, so I'm going to do the opposite, you know? Yeah. Like, so like, ¿qué, qué sentiste? <laughs> Did you feel like? Was it a liberation? Was it like relief? Was it like, fuck you, fuck this, you know, like society and standards, you know, whatever, like, what did you, what was that for you? What was that like? Yeah, I think when she did it, I was like, oh my gosh, but like, you know, then when I was sitting at the moment, I was like, ah, uh, I was having like second thoughts. And then I was like, fuck it, I was like, just, you're here, just do it. Yeah. And then when she showed me an espejo, I was like, ah. Oh, this actually looks cute. I like it. Yeah. Like I've not seen myself with it. And, mm -hmm. and I didn't think about it. Like, um, yeah, I was just like, I like it. It looks cute either way. Yeah. And then it's a, and then when I had the undercut, that was like, if it just like, it's a, it's a, I don't know how to explain it, but it's a feeling como like, estás soltando, you're really seeing like, you're, right. just like, yeah. you're feeling like, como estás entrando en tapa de transformación, even though yeah. it's like, People are just like it's just hair. I was like, yeah. no, it's just like it's it's part of you, like it's part of your body. You grow with it, like you like right. you know, like lose us como protección a veces when you're shy, you touch your hair or like or you hide just behind like it, it makes you yeah. you hide behind it or you just may feel comfortable and confident with it. And mm -hmm. and it was really short, and I had like the bus cut, and I liked it. I just felt like it gave me this. I've never really considered myself really feminine. Like I was like kind of like a tomboy mm -hmm. um, type of like, me gustan cosas que like I wouldn't consider really feminine. So mm -hmm. for me, like it, me gustaba cuando me lo recogía y se miraba like the undercut. It gave me like this like really. It made me feel more confident. I was like, mm -hmm. I really like this. I'm like, I feel confident. I like it. Yeah. And that sounds yeah, very so empowering. What, yeah mm -hmm. that's amazing I think yeah I think yeah. a lot of the times we get tied into like these beauty standards or like yes. these roles that we have to fill and we we don't and I think it's really cool that you did that and even though you I mean it was on impulse like you did what you wanted to do and you felt great afterwards so yeah that's and cool. then when I like went really short that was when I went to like um my friend and me to see me lo corto corto and I remember I was biking home and I could feel all the wind tocar me like scalp and everything oh, yeah it was like, dio like, dio como escalofrío. <laughs> and I was like this is a different feeling because that's cubierto con tu cabello no te das right. cuenta mm -hmm. hasta que está super corto y luego sientes el viento y you're like oh my god and I remember I got home y me quité el casco and I was like ya llegué and then my dad was like his eyes were just like oh what the <laughs> fuck did you just do right and I'm just here like like parada ahí. like I feel like I have a baby face too so then I stay like you can see like my baby face with, <laughs> with short hair and everything and my dad was just like he got so angry and I really? was just like yeah and mm -hmm. I was like really I was sad and I was mad because it's like why are you making it a big deal out of a haircut yeah. And then my mom me cuenta que the reason he was mad was because I me corté el cabello así really short, like a, a cabello de hombre. And for him, that was like, is my daughter like lesbian or whatever? So you can see like the homophobic mentality oh, there. Yeah. And I was just like, damn, just for a haircut, you're upset. And even if I was, that's mm, fucked up. Yeah, that's fucked it up. is. Like that's telling me. You know, like, so, like, it's fucked up because you don't provide a safe space for your children, even if they do want to come out or not, because yeah. you already have that mentality. So, for me, it was just, like, wow. And, um, yeah, and so then I saw a picture later, but he had long hair back in his juventud, right? And I was, like, Dad, you're telling me that boys need to have short hair and women need to have long hair. I was, like, but you are here in this picture with long hair. Tell him. Like, tell him. So make it make sense yeah so <laughs> what did he do was, in that moment my dad was just like it was a style you know and I was like same with this it's a style right. like don't right. don't trip yeah. about it but, but yeah, yeah it was I yeah I didn't care back then I was like I don't care you can get mad I don't care 
but how good of you to to do it anyway like cut your hair regardless you know of who you know whatever like it's it was your decision it's your body it's your hair mm -hmm. i think a lot of people are scared to change any you know make a certain change because they're afraid of what other people might say mm -hmm. or how they react and especially people that they really care about you know and a, a big part of it is the, is the parents like you're you want to make sure that you're not disappointing your parents so you're not making them upset and like all these things because you love them at the same time like <laughs> you you did this you said it was impulsive but you don't regret it and you were happy mm -hmm. with it and you were like I'm proud that I did this you know and you owned it mm -hmm. regardless of wh whoever said anything you know so yeah um, like good good for you for doing that it takes yeah. a lot of thank courage thank you Yeah. And it's really interesting because ahorita que tengo el cabello largo, my dad todo el tiempo me dice, ay, qué bonito cabello, qué bonita estás. Pero no me decía eso cuando tenía el cabello corto. And I was just like, mm. and I was like, mm. I was just like, hmm. Pero este, yeah, and it was just like, I think at the beginning, you know, you had to learn how to take care of your hair too. And mm -hmm. you got to get used to it because at the beginning I was just like, did I make a wrong decision? Do I actually look good with this? And I was like, pues ya, ¿qué puedo hacer? Pues que, like, you know, rock it because mm -hmm. I'm not going to put, like, glue my hair back. Mm -hmm. And so then I say, I would do, like, uh, my eyeliner, like, my, my eyes. And I was like, put my earrings mm -hmm. and vámonos. Right. Yeah. Like, just, yeah. Yeah. I just think in general, people shouldn't make too big of a deal with, like, changes like a haircut you know right. what I mean I feel like we associate like oh if you identify as this or like if you like people of this then you look like this when like all of that is not real you know our, right. all of that is just like these social things that we create <clears throat> and right. I don't think it should be a big deal I think if people want to have short hair like they should have short hair if you want to have long hair mm -hmm. they should have long hair if they want to have you know whatever they can they want to do with their body they should be able to do it without mm -hmm. any judgment and unfortunately yeah. like that we're not there yet. Uh, right. But I'm hoping that, you know, people become more open-minded. I did want to share a story that you, you're you talking about hair. I did the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> It's not about society. Okay, <clears throat> let me just say it really quickly because it just made me laugh when you said like, oh, did I make the wrong decision? Okay, so if people don't know, I wear my hair in a part because I have a deep widow's peak. So if people are watching on YouTube, you can tell it's like hella deep, right? And yo, one day I was like, I don't want to have a widow's peak anymore. So guess what my dumbass did? Uh oh. <laughs> I grabbed the little part of the widow's peak, like esta parte, <clears throat> people watching on YouTube. And then I literally cut it and then I decided to shave it. And I was and I thought it was like problem solved. I don't have a widow's peak anymore. And then tell me why my hair started growing. <laughs> <laughs> did it grow out it grew out I had hair sticking out like this and then I was like well I need to solve this let me I'm gonna get some bangs now and this was in college like my dumbass it like thought that I would solve my issue of like removing my widow's peak <laughs> and then tell me why I during that time I was in danza and we had a like a performance and I had to put my hair back and legit I had little hair sticking out <laughs> Like lots of hairspray. Of hairspray didn't even help. Uh, but yeah, that, um, I'm really impulsive too when it comes to my hair. And that was something that I was just like, I'm done with the widow's peak and you're the men's side. Like you can't get rid of one. Okay, yeah, so I just funny. wanted to share that. I thought it was hilarious. Uh, I feel like so funny. everybody has some type of experience where they cut their own hair and then they regret it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like when I was a kid, actually, I think I did this. I like me corté los bangs when I was a little kid. I mean, I was, you know, I didn't really know exactly what I was doing, but I feel like so many kids do that where they start to like cut their hair and then their parents come in and they're like, ¿Qué te hiciste tu cabello? Like what, what? Oh, they freak out. Um, so I think we've all at some point in our life do something to our hair that we're like, okay, maybe we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Yo, my, my sobrina, Naidalina, she like cuts her hair. Uh -huh. And then she has like, for a moment, she made herself a mullet. Like her hair was like short here, nice. like así, super cool. <laughs> and she's like going around rocking it. And hey. I'm just like, dice su mamá que ella sola agarra la tijera y se lo corta. Es que no le gusta que, que le estorba. And then right. so mamá was like, well, you gotta let it grow. So then you can like pull it back. But she was like, no, I'm gonna just cut it. And she would grab her scissors and be like creating herself a mullet. Know. So it was, really, yeah. it was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Do it. I mean. As long as she's yeah. not poking her eyes out, she's good. Yeah. yeah. I would be scared and to, then I, to put scissors in my own hair. Yeah. <laughs> I would be scared. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think um, 
in 2016, I, I think that's when I um, dyed my hair black. And I wanted to go full, like, black, like, así, negro, negro. Mm-hmm. And then me corté los bangs, así, like, super cool. I thought it looked cool. You look and good. Este... It was a look. It's a, it's, it it was was you have so look. many good looks. Yeah, so many good like, looks. That was, that one's a good, that one's good. Yeah, I think that was it. And then I let it grow. And then in the quarantine, I cut it again because I was, you know, quarantine. Mm-hmm. Um, I cut it again short and it was really funny. And I dyed it later, like kind of reddish, yellow. Mm-hmm. Siquito, and now it's like this, like long and yeah. cafecito. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you try different colors. I know, Michelle, you've tried different colors, too. I've seen you with like red, red before. That's mm-hmm. how we remember Michelle with red hair. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You pulled that off, too. I Mish. used to be bold. Now I'm just me now. I don't know what I am. <laughs> It was cool. I like that look. It's just it, like you said, it's very hard to maintain like certain looks. So like the red hair, super hard to maintain. Like you have to wash it very little or you have to wash it with like really cold water. Um, so, you know, like the hair dye gets off and it turns like into this weird brown. And then like the roots. No? And then the roots. Yeah, because my yeah. hair is super dark. So and my hair grows super fast. También. So just to maintain everything. And then also money. And I was like, no, I'm not trying to do that. Yo. But if I could, I would do it again. I would do, I would color my hair again. I want to do it, but I mean, dinero and like, like, do I want to spend that much money or not? And especially when right. you have long, thick hair, people want to charge you a lot, which makes sense because, you know, you're using product, you're, people are doing the service. That shit so adds up. It adds up and then a lot of maintenance. So maybe one day yeah. I'll dye it again. I want to, but oh, right now I am not. I did not like yeah. dyeing it when I dyed mine because I have really light hair. So anytime that I dyed it, like, se me hacía más oscuro, right? But then se me, se me notaban más las, las raíces because oh. of the stark difference. You know, as my hair got darker each time I dyed it, my, you know, you could see the contrast, you know, because my hair is lighter. So it just, yeah, didn't work out. Yeah. I knew, <laughs> I also knew Cynthia when she had, she had dyed her hair dark. Yeah, that we was a bad idea. Her, she she had dyed her hair dark one of the summers, I think. Made me look even there. whiter. I was like, no. Already? I don't think yeah. I saw you with dark hair. What is black hair? That was in, uh, that was in high school. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, oh, wow. Thank you for sharing your experience about that. That's yeah. really cool. And I Same. hope this empowers other people, whoever's listening to, you know, if you want to change your hair, if you want to do whatever to your hair, do it, you know, do it's, it, yeah, just do it safe. Hey, like if you're trying to Be bleach yeah. it or something, like make sure it doesn't fall well, off. Right. That's all I'm saying. Right. <laughs> yeah. And just no hair I will grow I, back. Yeah. I think when mm-hmm. I did mine in quarantine, I went to Walgreens and I bought a box. And I think that made my hair fall a little bit because I was mm. like, why is my hair falling a lot? And I started to panic. And I was like, ah, this is why I don't dye my hair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I wanted to dye my hair así como like azul, go from like lighter oh. azul to dark azul. But <gasps> then cool. I went and asked how much that was going to be. And it was above 200. And I was like, oh, never mind. I would mm. just rather buy a wig or something. And then I told my sister, I was like, you know what? I think I'm just going to, if I do decide to go with, because I want like bold colors too. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, I'd rather just invest in wigs and that way I don't have to damage my hair. I can just like, you know, pop it up, me lo arreglo, mm-hmm. go to a party, come back and it's good. Yeah. Me lo quito and hey, I'm a different person. And don't you feel like you're a different person? Like, yeah. I feel like my personality changes, like yeah. my attitude changes. And yeah. I'm just like, so, I feel like it's so, so yeah. connected to your identity. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love getting but, a new, yeah. like a new haircut or like a new cut or just even getting my nails done, I think a different color always mm. like makes me feel like a certain way, you know, I'm like, am I feeling a red color? Am I feeling a black color? Am I feeling a white color? Depending on your mood. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I like it. I like using my hair and like, if I like, if I can as like a way to empower me. Yeah. And I, awesome. I think uh, when I took my students up north in Menominee and one of my students, she was like pulling her hair. I like, like, and she was like talking how like frustrated she was with her hair because it enreda mucho. And I just like I saw this like relationship like como like frustration with the hair. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, I was like, do you need que te ayude? And I was like teaching her like you know you detangle your hair desde abajo, 
luego vas subiendo para que no te lastimes y te jales tanto, pero cuando te estás jalando, and like, you get irritated with your hair and yourself, right. and like, no mm -hmm. sé, cuidado, tu cabello hay que tratarlo con cuidado, es like, hay que you know, quererlo, mm -hmm. and este, and that, eso le, le, le di un poco de mi producto, like, you know, like, aceitito, y lo echamos, ese lo peinó, and you can see later how she was just like this, like, peinándose, and like, stuff like that, and I was just like, a lot of, like, I didn't grow up with my mom teaching me how to brush my hair, like, tú sola vas aprendiendo, and so for me, it was just like that, I've always wanted also a little sister, so, like, um, it was just like that bonding moment of, like, you know, brushing her hair, like, teaching her how to brush her hair, and just later seeing her, like, just calmly brushing her, not, like, pulling mm -hmm. her hair, and mm -hmm. I felt like that was really beautiful, Yeah. yeah and I also, is. and when I had my hair short, I kid you not, I was missing my long hair. I was like, mm. I want to braid my hair. Like, I miss braiding my hair. And and even my grandma was like, <laughs> my grandma, when I went back to the pueblo, she was like, she looked at me. Because I had, yo llegué con el cabello así, like, short, short, short. Mm. And she looks at me, she's like, pareces niño. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and that was like her first reaction. And I was like, okay. <laughs> well, I'm not. Well, I was like, I'm not a grandma, but she's like, y tus trenzas, y tu pelo, and I was like, yeah, it'll grow, we'll do trenzas later. <laughs> yeah, hair will grow yeah. back. Mm -hmm. I feel like we could talk about hair like all day. This is a really cool conversation, yeah. <laughs> and I haven't actually dived deep into hair like that before with anybody, um, so that's really cool. Um, but I know we only have you for a limited amount of time, so I wanted yeah, to yeah. like talk about like connecting with our roots, right? Whatever that mm -hmm. means to us, right? We can talk about it in whatever way that means to us. But I remember, um, like, it was really cool talking with you before we recorded this, we were trying to plan out like what to, you know, what are you comfortable talking about? And you made these really valid points that I feel many people can relate to, of, mm -hmm. you know, gr growing up with an immigrant family or immigrant parents, or you being an immigrant or whatever it is. Um, and you, you know, you know, move here, there's always, at least for me, I feel like I am connected to my roots to an extent in terms of my culture and tradition, all that kind of stuff. But there's also sometimes I feel like a mismatch, um, especially with the environment that I grew up in and the, you know, who I was, who I interacted with as a, as a kid and, and growing mm -hmm. up and going to a school that was predominantly white, um, having that exposure, like all that kind of stuff really shapes us as human beings. Yeah. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, you shared a little bit about your story of, you know, you were born in Cali, then you lived in Oaxaca for a while, and then you came to Wisconsin, and how different that was for you, and like, yeah. so I wanted to ask you, like, how do you process connecting with your roots, or what are you doing connecting with your roots, or how, you know, like, just kind of explain to us what that means to you. Yeah, I think cuando yo llegué, como crecí en el pueblo, I didn't really felt, like, I didn't know who I was. I, mm -hmm. I knew who I was, like Mexicana, Chinanteca, este, hablamos el Chinanteco y todo eso. Like, I knew, like, that was, like, my home. Like, that was la, la raíz de nuestras mm -hmm. familias. Like, that even though I was born in Long Beach, I knew that, like, I was tied back to el pueblo de San Juan Quetepec. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Pero creo que todo eso cambió cuando llegué a Wisconsin because I was, like, I realized how much how disconnected I was with a lot of things and how I didn't value a lot. Um, the fact that I could have learned the language of Chinanteco, but I, but I didn't because like my parents spoke Spanish, the school was in Spanish, mm -hmm. my grandma kind of spoke Spanish, so my friends spoke Spanish. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really like a need. And um, so when I came here, there was a lot of like, no, la cultura es diferente, uh, es, ahora ya no es español, es mostly, mostly in English, mm -hmm. and then este, so I had to like, you know, relearn English for, because I didn't speak English for like six years, right. and the only thing that I spoke with was with my sister, like our little secrets and stuff like that, and my grandma did not like us speaking English in the house, she was like, I don't want you to speak English, like, leave that out of here, mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and then, the more I was growing up in Wisconsin, the I kind of started feeling lost. I started feeling like, como, um, uh, yeah, and then I went to the dorms and 
I I started realizing how much how little I knew about El Pueblo and how um, I stopped talking with my parents a little bit. So then it's the, I kind of did feel like that um, dissociation. Mm. And when I went to Menominee in 2017, I think um, that was like the year from since 2010 to 2017. I never really felt part of Madison, even though I, you know, I grew up here. I experienced I went through high school and I went right. to college, but I didn't. I always knew that this wasn't my home. I I saw myself as like a visitor, and like um because I always knew that home was the pueblo de mis papas like that, mm-hmm. that was my home mm-hmm. like are they no both from ese pueblo that. um mm-hmm. okay. yeah but they didn't know each other until they met in california which is funny oh okay oh wow mm-hmm. yeah yeah cute and then this so, yeah uh-huh. so i went to menominee and um and they told us i think when i went with my students they they said something really powerful about how we are welcome here that we are their relatives and that we are we are guests on their land not mm-hmm. because you know when when you think about the u.s or at least in mi pueblo when we think about the u.s we used to think about it as like es tierra de gringos tierra de los blancos right which is not true and it's so yeah. fucked up that like that mentality a lot of people have okay. that mm-hmm. and yeah. so like just as a reminder, like, you know, like we are in Ho Chunk land and it's not like the white people's land, it's Ho Chunk right. land and there's stolen land. stolen land, you know, and then there's Ojibwe, Menominee. Mm-hmm. Um, so when the Menominee community, I went up there and I saw a guy and I was just like, you look like you could be my tío. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, what? Mm-hmm. And the environment there, because I didn't grow up in a city like that in El Pueblo, it was in Un Pueblito, Entre Las Montañas. Mm-hmm. So, cuando llegamos up north in Menominee, estábamos, it was all green, pinos, y tenían como pinos igual que en El Pueblo. So, mm-hmm. I, immediately, there was like a connection in Pino y El Río. Mm-hmm. And for yeah. me, cuando estábamos afuera platicando, se sentía como si estuviéramos en el rancho. And I just felt, that it wasn't until 2017 that I felt like I was home that Madison, like Wisconsin felt like home. And for that, for me to listen to that, to hear that, and my students to hear that, and I had students who were, you know, who are undocumented, who who have DACA, but like right. we never felt welcome in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. For him to say that, and the, the other um, relatives there to say that was really reaffirming. And it was like, yes, like we do belong here. And, like we are welcome here. Mm-hmm. So I think that was really powerful for me to that see is. that in Menominee. Yeah. Did that feeling That's really stay beautiful with you? and Sorry. powerful? Yeah, and... I've yeah, I've never cried like in front of people like that. But that whole weekend, I was mm-hmm. crying. Like I Very cried powerful. in front of students. I cried like with like the older people who were there, and and that was like also the the time we were talking about language. They were talking about yeah. Um, he looked at me and he was like, "Can you offer a prayer in your language?" And I didn't think about Spanish as my language I thought about I thought about Chinanteco and mm-hmm. I was and I felt so sad because I couldn't offer a prayer in my parents language because I didn't really I couldn't really form a whole sentence like nicely so I was just like I don't I, I was like I don't know my language and he was like just say whatever you can so then I just introduced myself and I was like ah more which is like hello um and then the rest I did it in Spanish but I do remember that it's a messy nudo en la garganta. Yeah. And I just, I don't even, I don't know how to explain it, but I just wanted to cry. Mm-hmm. And one of like the elder, la señora, she looked at me and she was like, keep your language. Like, even though you don't know a lot of it, like make sure you, um, when you speak it, your elders are listening. And like, they're like, they stop and they listen to you speak. And mm-hmm. I, it was just that that she just said, it made so llorar. And I was like, again, crying. And then they talked about how they're learning their language and they're like, ya están grandes, right? And they're Mm -hmm. um, working so hard to relearn their language because it was forced out of of them, you know, like, and it's so sad because like, cuando yo pienso en ellos, and I think about going back home in my community, like, I cannot imagine going through that, you know, and like a lot of like, in our community, there's some traditions that we don't practice because like, 
of like la religion and everything that like you know colonization but yeah. our language was preserved and here in Menominee um their language was taken away but they they were able to save some of their traditions and their practices mm -hmm. and for me it was como al revés and it was really como heartbreaking to see and also you you see the resistance in in their community yeah and they talked we shared a lot of similar things about water prayer um healing and and they have like that like esa conexión que también tuve con ellos was like when they um they brought water que nace de la tierra mm -hmm. y nosotros en el pueblo tenemos también ojos de agua ojos on this day, nace el agua, es fresco, frío, you can yeah. taste it, it's, it tastes so different, and, and so when they gave us a cup of that water, like, it's another como que se me nudo la garganta, because I was just like, I don't know what my body was going through, my spirit, everything, but it was just como like, a, like a whole awakening, but it wasn't like a beautiful one, it was like a hard one, it was like a, a painful one, and, and we were just in this teaching lodge, and they were, they were talking to us, and she was like, just, remember your language and like just don't don't ever stop saying it like and it was just like a like this guilt of like oh I should have learned I should have like you know but then at the same time I was like well I still have my parents and yeah. I can learn I can learn through them and so then that's another another conversation of you know like kind of reconnecting with my parents healing the harm that was caused you know through stuff that like happens um and because like I I can't just go to my pueblo like and just sit, stay again and learn like I I had like I was going to school and, like also it's really expensive to be traveling back and forth so my immediate connection to my language are my parents so like that right. was my my first step to be like okay you guys gotta talk about things gotta overcome things you guys um really you know heal that relationship basically yeah and mm -hmm. and that's how it started a little bit my my connection through my group has been through my parents healing that relationship and um you know addressing the harm and really trying to work and do better from both end mm -hmm. um and, and preserving that language yeah there's just a lot of advocates in wisconsin who are native who continue to share and open these spaces so it's amazing that you know you were able to find that in Wisconsin, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Um, and yeah, in general, like, I, I just think that's super powerful. And there isn't, to be quite honest, a big indigenous community in Madison. So a lot of people do find those spaces a little bit outside of Madison. But I think mm -hmm. now, like what you were saying is right, that there are these with through social media and through all these things, you see more empowerment of the indigenous community and more empowerment in reclaiming the language, reclaiming the traditions and just yeah. like um, also in solidarity. You know what I mean? Um, just because like the U.S. and Mexico are, is it's one continent. It's one land. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that separates us are these borders, these man yep. borders, if you think about it. Um, but yeah, that, that's super powerful. Yeah. You said that you felt like home, like it was home for the first time when you went up there for that weekend, right? When you came back to Madison, did you still have that feeling living in Madison? Or was that like, that just kind of stayed with you that weekend and then you kind of were still working on that? You know what I mean? Like, did it change at all when you came back? It did because I know that like, I remember how I would talk about Wisconsin. I was like, why am I here? Like, I hate the cold. Like, after three years later, that was like, yeah, no, it's fucking cold here. <laughs> it gets really cold and people don't think about it. Like, you're in Cali, like, the the weather's nice. And right. but Wisconsin, Minnesota, has a frío por acá. Yeah. And so there's like, uh, and then you start seeing when you're so used to the sun and everything, and then like, te falta el sol. You can look at un año, dos años, it's fun. Like, you're learning about it like you're seeing the snow for the first time and then eventually you're like I am not liking this I'm not enjoying this and because I had that commitment before of like school and college um I felt like I had to stay here um uh, and because my parents are here and I feel like I one episode you guys were talking about um how home is where your parents are at right mm -hmm. and my parents are here so for me was Wisconsin was like this is where I'm gonna be at the moment because my parents are here yeah um 
but then after that trip in 2017 my question why am I here you know like what am mm-hmm. I meant to learn during my time here because the reality is like the person that I became in Wisconsin was not the person I was in Mexico or, or like in California if you ask people in California and Mexico they're gonna tell you a different version about me like mm. this madrosa in Mexico didn't care about school <laughs> here like people know me of like activists and like school and um doing all of these things and and I was introduced to that because of the spaces I was at not because like it was just like naturally I was like oh like all of this like I didn't like school I you know, eventually I was like, I thought like I was a burra and then I just wasn't smart. And then, you know, you have homies who are telling you later, like, you're smart, like you're yeah. chingona, you got this. Mm-hmm. So then you, you start believing it, right? And then you start seeing like, yeah, I got this. Like, what the heck? Um, mm-hmm. But that, um, I started asking, you know, like, what am I here to learn? And uh, what is this teaching me? And like, um, why am, like, there's a purpose why I'm here. Mm-hmm. And and then I realized, you know, like I made beautiful connections. I was able to like fund, um, co-fund a program with um, some compañeros, compañeras. And um, yeah, and then this day I met a lot of wonderful people here. And I think we've been doing a lot of beautiful work. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I would be doing this if I wasn't living here in Wisconsin, you know? And so I, I think about that a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just to bounce and... off of that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And then also no. like um a conversation that I had with like the Menominee community, they talked about the winter as a form of like resting, of mm-hmm. hibernating. And um uh they talk about when you when s- the storytelling, you know, like they use winter as a form of storytelling to gather and, and spend time with each other. And I know that my parents when we moved here at the beginning, they were working um, full time and then part time. So yo nunca los miraba cuando estaba en la escuela. Like, like I only see them on the weekends because we were at school and they were working all day. Um, so then it became como it becomes like soli- como lonely and solitario. And mm-hmm. I had only my siblings, so it was kind of fun to just just be us four. And and from that mentality, my parents also like puro chambiari, chambiari. Like right. you know, you're always hustling and there's no rest. Um, and so then I started like. I started kind of like moving myself with like the seasons on the primavera and summer and fall and um, winter. And I was like, fall and winter is for me to like enfocarme in cosas que puedo hacer. And then like spring and summer is for me to be all out and enjoy. So that mentality helped me a lot with my depression because I feel like for a moment it was like me estaba consumiendo y no sabía qué hacer. Yeah. And seeing it that way, I was like not feeling guilty for resting and actually just enjoying my family being able to have time with them and get to reconnect with each other was really important for me it's really important just to bounce off of that I wanted to I know you mentioned how you got involved in you know with the work that some of your friends are doing because of the environment is that how you got involved into being like an organizer and an activist in the Madison community was it through like school or was it um like did you just can you talk to us more about that yeah so I when I came to I came as a sophomore for in high school and then this day I remember there was a Latinos Unidos group there oh what school and did you I, go to in Madison? Memorial High School okay Ooh, me talking I, about like as if I knew I tutored there. <laughs> I'm not from Madison but I, I'm just I'll look it up afterwards yeah I went to Memorial High School um I thought it was like a riquillo. It's not like as rich as you see, like Middleton, Verona, but mm-hmm. see it most like you know, wealthy people. I mean, yeah. yeah. What school did you, and, school did um, you go to be? Sorry. I went to Verona. Okay, Memorial Verona. Verona was, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of bougie. Ooh, Verona girl. was very, Ooh, y'all went to bougie your schools and I did. Verona is, was, is still very bougie. But the new have, building that they made. Oh my Girl, gosh. it's so huge, and they have like an Olympic size and Olympic size pool, segun, and like this fancy the ass gym gym and, and this gym. Like Michelle, it looks like I was looking at pictures inside the cafeteria. Looks like the High School Musical cafeteria. Wow, <laughs> with like the second floor and wow. like wow, yeah. It our high they, school shared a building with their elementary <laughs> school. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, it was. It was yeah, very very bougie. Anyway, mm-hmm. sorry, go continue. Ahead, go ahead. Continue. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about bougie Madison. No, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, um, I, 
I started like um, Latinos Unidos. I was in ESL my sophomore year. Um, and then I think my senior year, I was president, co-president. Um, first, I think first lunch and then Christian was second lunch um, or the other way around, I don't remember. Um, and then, then we would do like baile cada año, like Latinos Unidos cool. do like a yearly dance and people would come just to like, which it was, I still feel, I have my ifs about it, but like, you know, yeah. like a lot of weritos mm-hmm. would come and like enjoy the Latino it feels culture, awkward. you know? Yeah. Oh, like, oh yeah, that's awkward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some like um, um, students from like West would come and like enjoy the dance. Like you were able to invite one friend and stuff like that. Um, but it was kind of like it and we would do community service and stuff like that. And I think it was my sophomore, my senior year that I went to Centro Hispano because I remember um, someone told me I can go there and ask for volunteering services because no tenía amigos and mm-hmm. um, I was just, a, you know, just reading books and, like, you know, trying to be aplicada. Um, so I was like, I'm going to go check it out and see what it's about. And <laughs> And I went and Eugenia me recibió. She's like, Maricela, welcome. And she, she like, Eugenia is like a, like a dope ass tia, like that you see, que te, like, you know, you're just like, ah, like, yeah. um, and so Eugenia was like, vente, like, vente, claro. And she immediately made me feel welcome in the mm-hmm. community. And, and in that time, se llamaba Proyecto Líder, um, a youth space. Um, and there was a lot of art using as activism and stuff like that. And, and Proyecto Líder was also combined with, not combined, but partnered with like Convida, which is like youth who were going through like um, the system, you know, who got tickets and stuff like that. And so it was a space for them to, you know, instead of paying the ticket, which is like Madison has this fucked up system. Oh, yes. um, they, they're they able to do community service and, you know, and, and do like restorative justice, justice yeah. and stuff like that. Um, so that's how I learned about Convida and um, Proyecto Líder. And I got involved in my senior year. And at that time, we were doing a mural talking about cultura, um, resistencia, identidad. So it was a, it's a beautiful mural that we still, we kept for regeneración. Um, and then, you know, it died off. To, and then we we were having problems with like, you know, Centro, like the past management. I think it was mm-hmm. like a white dude. A lot of fucked up shit that he was doing. So um, I know like the facilitators were going to leave, you know, they were like, you know, we're just, we, we're now down with this. We're going to leave. And for us, we're like, oh, Henia, we're here because of oh, Henia. Like she's our homie and like stuff like that. Yeah. So as soon as they stepped out, we were like, we're taking our mural with us and we're stepping out of the building. So we yeah. left with our mural and yeah. then we, Mecha hosted us at their place. And that's how I started getting to know machistas and stuff like that, about mm-hmm. like universities mm-hmm. and stuff like that, because they hosted their space and we were able to mm-hmm. have like our meetings there. Um, y ya, uh, and durante ese tiempo, we came out with the Expresarte name, which is like we're expressing ourselves through art. And so we do poetry. We had our friend Lupe who does amazing, um, um, uh, ¿cómo se dice? Spoken word. Um, cool. And she's really talented, and like, we would talk about her struggles, and she would write it down. And she made this beautiful poem that we presented, like, um, and when we presented our mural and stuff like that at the University of Madison, um, and it was just like really beautiful. It was like a space where, like, every Friday we would, I would, I remember I was, I would leave school, get on the bus, head straight to Mecha, and have our circles and just have a good time, and then go back home. And that was, mm-hmm. like, I was always looking forward for Fridays. And that's how I met friends and eventually expressed that I died off. It was run by adults, you know, when adults get busy, you know, they mm-hmm. can't keep up with it. Mm-hmm. You know, like you need someone to always be committed to it. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, it just eventually like died off. And then um, I was in college and later um, Julissa Ventura, Dr. Julissa Ventura now, yeah. um, <laughs> she was doing her dissertation and yeah. her um, PhD on youth spaces. And she invited me, Rafael, Joanna, and Alondra to create this program. And we were planning it. Like, what is what does it mean to have a, sa- a safe and brave space in Madison? And what, is it, what does it look like? Um, mm-hmm. And what do we need in those spaces? And so we started talking about it. And like, we all have from... We all came from different backgrounds, so it was really nice to come up with an idea. Yeah. And then Rafael was like, he was like, we need a name. And we were like, okay, well, what should we call it? Should we keep Expresarte or should we do something else? And then Rafael was like, what about Regeneración? 
and I was like regeneración and he, and, and he comes up with like he eventually ends up teaching us about regeneración that is a, was a movimiento in Mexico for los hermanos Flores Magón Uh -huh. um, eh, es donde informaban a la comunidad a través de un periódico sobre lo que estaba pasando, la relación entre México y Estados Unidos. Super dope, super amazing. And I was just like, what? So, like, yeah. tell me more. Because I'm in, in Oaxaca and everything. And I was like, what? And Rafael was, it's all from Oaxaca. So, we were like, we were like talking about this. And he was, hey, Rafa, like, I admire Rafa. He is, you know, like a brain that was like, a veces le decimos la enciclopedia because he knows a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but he was like telling us all of this information and we're just like, wow. And we ended up using regeneración and we just added like la baraquetas because like um, we wanted to also represent como es regeneración, right. como cada, cada generación es diferente, eso se va regenerando. Right. Um, so it's like como las células and everything. So yeah. it, it was like a... It just like it just naturally came, and then yeah. in 2015 we kicked the program, and it's running until now. So it's pretty dope. Wow, it's still it's still running. Mm -hmm. That's dope. Mm -hmm. You said yeah. 2015. Mm -hmm. We started in 2015. Six that's years. Amazing. Going on six years. That, mm -hmm. That's amazing because yeah. you y'all started this space to provide the space for the youth of Madison. Yeah, and it was hella needed, and yeah. you know you were part of that to start it you know yeah and um one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that people who let's say i leave i left right like my position was going to be taken by the youth who had participated in the program so no outsider yeah. can come in i was like yes. i want to come in and do something for regeneración the only people who are able to apply to have that regeneración position it must the only requirement is you must have participated in the program and you're willing to come back because you you you've seen how the program runs yeah. you know what's needed you know um you're part of the community you know what we didn't do what we do what we did do and then you add to it and I just thought it was genuine and also gives an opportunity for the youth who participated to have that opportunity to co-facilitate mm -hmm. so that's that's I think that's something beautiful that we made sure to maintain that, yeah and you're like and you're re like you're Regenerando. Like, regenerando the like you're the youth in the community and the community are giving back and it's yeah. just like this beautiful cycle of like growing so that's yeah cool. what so, ages so are the youth proud. sorry oh, high school nice. oh actually school. yeah it was the same and i'm so proud because we were able to advocate to get paid so now they're not doing it as like community service like how i started but yeah. now they're gonna get paid for it so we're yes. like yes pay us to do the work yeah um, yeah Yeah, and so like we started with only high school students from the Dane County area, uh -huh. um, and then we had youth from uh, Wanakee who came to our first conference that we hosted, um, the In La Ketch conference, and um, that person was like, "I love it. I want to join, but I'm from Wanakee." And I was like, "As long as you can tr um, have transportation and, and you can come, you're more than welcome." So that person made it. Um, that person would like make sure to um, make it all the the meetings. And it was just so beautiful to see people from Wanaki come to right. Madison to um, be part of the space. Yeah. And then later we had a mom who was looking for a space for their child um, who was like in eighth grade. And we were like, I don't know, like this on high school, like, I don't know, they're gonna be able to, you know, comprehend what we're talking about. But we gave it a chance and oh my gosh, I am so excited we did because that person was, is so amazing. Like when we did our third conference, that person was able to like um, organize. Can I like tell the story because it's just so beautiful. Yeah, yeah of um, course. Our, like, our last in like edge conference, um, we were only having it for high school students, right? Mm -hmm. And so she comes and, and she's an eighth grader and, and she's like Marisela is this conference only for high school students and I was like yeah I was like Oscar, I have friends who are interested in coming can I can I bring them and I was like all right how many I was like yeah like how many spaces do you need but how many can we get and I was like oh wow. well I don't know <laughs> and she's like and she's like because I have like I have my whole like friends and class that I want to bring 
people I think they will really like the conference. And I, I was like, okay, just, all right, just let me know how much um, slots you need and I'll reserve that for you. And she goes to her school and she, she's like organizing. She takes applications and she's organizing everything. And and I told her like, you, you need a, a chaperone and transportation because we can't, we don't have the budget to like offer that for you. Mm-hmm. And so she's like, no worry, I'll take care of it. This <sighs> homie, oh wow. my gosh. Eighth grade, she, y'all. <laughs> eighth grade and she goes back to her school and this is oregon middle school oh my she gosh goes, yes yes it's outside of madison also she a very white school. school it is it is so that's that was one of the exceptions that's why we allowed her to be in a space because it was like she was like we got nothing in oregon yeah so this it's is like the only school that we're counting so i was like let, let's do it like, we're only making an exception for you to join the generation so, so she goes she's organizing everything and she goes to her teacher she's like can you be our chaperone for this conference and she was like I need to talk to the principal get you a bus she's like don't worry I already talked to my principal and he's giving us a bus and she was when on I it. wow <laughs> I'm telling you she was on it so with that I was just I was really mind blown I was really proud and I was just like super excited to see this eighth grader so eager to participate in this conference Mm -hmm. bring her friends with her and like she didn't even like you know the teachers usually the chaperones are involved with like recruiting the students right getting the bus advocating for everything and she just did everything and she just told her teacher I just need you to take us. everything is already handled and for me I was like oh my gosh like, you're so amazing yeah. and I think that was one of the beautiful stories that I have and experience with regeneración yeah of multiple that's stories such a that cool are out story. there mm-hmm. damn that's cool I yeah. could just I could see it in your face how excited you are telling that story <laughs> and how proud you are um and you yeah moment. The reason I asked you why, well, I mean, how, how old the, the youth were because it was because like, I work with kids a lot. I mean, they're, they're little, but I always think about like, we can always teach and empower at a young age, younger than people I think give kids credit for. Like mm-hmm. even you can even go younger than eighth grade. So like, I was just wondering like how old they were and like, that's really cool that, um, that, that was able to happen for those eighth graders. And, um, yeah, I, it was yeah. just, really, yeah. it's really cool. Just quick question before we segue into the next topic. So you started like that um, regeneration started in 2015 and it's still going and, you know, you're still in the Madison area. Um, How have you seen activism or organizing change since then to now? I mean, Mm -hmm. it's still going on regeneration, but in terms of organizing, I've noticed that like it's been growing. Um, have you seen that or what have you seen and like what are your thoughts about that yeah i think that antes se le daba la responsabilidad solamente a una persona right like that's our leader and you know like todo like el peso del trabajo cae en esa persona and like that expectation mm-hmm. and also like being like considered the leader is also like a, a a big role to take and it's like um did you feel a sense of pressure it is a lot of pressure and it's like um now suddenly you have a lot of expectations from the community and you're like whoa mm-hmm. and but I also like something I talk with my students about how how I view leaders I was like yes like you know some people are really great at like public speaking and like you know reaching out to the people and stuff like that but organizing goes beyond that it goes yeah. beyond like mobilizing the community creating yeah, it's bigger than the individual right like yeah. I people are like oh you're a leader and everything but for me I'm just like it's not about me it goes beyond that it goes as the um the community I for me it's like I want to make sure that when I'm in my community I feel safe and then I can count in my community right. and that like if things go down that your community is going to show up and I feel like I've seen a lot of that in like the black community mm-hmm. and I've, I've learned a lot from the black community and in, in yeah there's a long history of black organization and mobilization in the united states that we don't really talk about yeah but yeah Mm -hmm. everything that i think that we've adopted has come from the black community if i'm being honest Mm -hmm. yeah so then i've seen recently i've seen a state a lot of like you know like the latino leaders you know take up like this 
higher position of power and like yeah. with this mentality like there I think this is this mentality that like you you go up the ladder and that means like you you made it right but at some point it's like you made it but not your whole community right. because we're still struggling out here right. so like I think people get confused with that like mm. oh he made it and like, now he yeah. represents us or whatever and I was like I'm still struggling and we're still like my Is homie over here still struggling so like mm-hmm. yeah. so, um so that's something that I've seen and noticed um and then what they go like that recognition you know, sometimes it's like people like to be recognized for their work and stuff like that, which is understandable. But when it becomes just like, you know, recognizing each other in our little circle and stuff like that can be like problematic um, because we're discrediting the hard work that communities have done. Yeah. Like when we go, cuando vamos a protestas, like, yeah, you see like the leader and like the, per- the people who are in position of power show up. But like the only reason like that protesta is powerful is because the whole community else. is leaving work and jeopardizing their work to show up and you know numbers is power mm-hmm. um so yeah and I just I feel like a lot of the medicine community have been talking about it lately how you know who are we applauding who are actual our leaders and like what does even leaders mean mm-hmm. and like I told I always tell my students you know like I don't really fuck with the idea of like leader because then like it erases the the involvement and the struggle of the whole community mm-hmm. and because when you when you pick up a book and you like you don't read the thousand names of people who lost their lives who like right um who are not in the books who who like are like spirits who their names are not mentioned or prayed for you know so I think about that a lot and, yeah. and so I I always I come with this grassroots organization mentality of like mm-hmm. is this la raíz yeah that's super important to talk about I'm glad you share yeah I'm glad you share about your experience like the experience here in Madison because Michelle you made a really good point when we were talking about this before we recorded that a lot of people don't really consider or think about activism in smaller cities or smaller towns and it's very much the attention is on bigger cities yeah um so I appreciate you sharing all of that um, in regards to the Madison community, because I think a lot of smaller cities, smaller towns are overlooked in terms of all that they're doing um, mm-hmm. to uplift, you know, communities of color. Um, mm-hmm. So I appreciate you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same. Really Shout quick. out to all the community organizers in yes. Madison and mm-hmm. in the Wisconsin area, because it's not tough. I mean, it is tough um, just because like I I can, the thing is is that like when we think of like organizing and activism we think of like these huge cities that have a lot of resources and have organizations with that money but if you think about like places like madison you don't really have that you know so it's a lot of community organizing and that's what i see super powerful because every time there's like May Day or like just other protests, like all these people, all these people of color show up and so many people see it on the news and they're like, where are they coming from? And they're like, well, we live here, you know? Right. And I think that's super powerful to see because it is communities that are organizing instead of like being in these big cities where it there are organizations and resources that can fund all of that. But in, in these communities, like it's the community putting the work. It's the community that that's giving their money that's coming from their paycheck. Um, and that's what we're seeing that mean right now with Brooklyn center in Minnesota yep. with what happened with Duante, Wright, And you're right now seeing the community organizing and showing up for Brooklyn center. Um, so I think that's super powerful. And I think that's some, something somewhere that hopefully we're shifting more towards when it comes to like organizing and activism is empowering the community to like show their power and to show up and to support mm-hmm. each other because they they can do that it's just like making it more accessible or making it more like making people more empowered to do it because I think like you mentioned Maricela there's power in community and um, everyone can have a role in it something that I've been observing has been a lot of youth who I've met through like middle school to high school now in college are taking really beautiful roles and are um, example, like there's youth who I didn't necessarily work with, but like, I know like from East high school students who graduate, who were heavily involved with organizing the protests that was happening in Madison, the Diaz in Latinos, and it was like high school students. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know Mecha supported them with like art supplies and stuff like that. And, um, 
you know, seeing how now they're in college, oh, some of them are in college and how they're uh, taking positions either in Mecha, um, a, a youth who is in, um, in UW Madison about starting UW Dreamers. And, you know, mm-hmm. that's not like, that's run by youth and like youth who are doing the work. And mm-hmm. so it's really nice to see that. Um, and, and sometimes even with nonprofits, like, there's things that we couldn't do to support because of like legal stuff and partnering stuff and, and politics. So it was really frustrating not being able to support um, things that was happening because like, oh, we got to be careful with donors. Oh, we got to be careful with this. And who are we right. partnering? And like all of this thing kind of like, if it, it feels like sometimes it limits you from actually doing the work. Um, and that's why I always, for me, like I, I love the idea of grassroots organizing because like, you don't have to please no donor you don't have to be careful with your language you don't got to be police in that in that term like you're free to really mobilize and organize which is Mm -hmm. what we're supposed to be doing um but yeah so it's pretty cool to see you take those positions as well yeah Mm -hmm. I, i love listening to all your stories and everything you have to say i know that it's like yes so i mean it you know, we still had the whole music one topic also <laughs> to ask you about. <laughs> um, but I mean, whatever y'all are feeling. Or we can talk a little bit about it. Okay. So okay. It, it would be a good way to end it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With you, with you, you announcing that you have a band, so we're gonna have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then Michelle's our manager. I'm your manager. First gig yes. is gonna be Summerfest 2022. Uh, Put it in your calendars. Be ready. For real. Yes. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Even este organizando en la comunidad fue porque también este no todo el tiempo es como protesta protesta a veces mm. es como con música y creo que um, lo que a mí me ayudó en en tiempos de como de sanación, de aprendizaje y de, en aprender lo, las injusticias que está pasando en México, aquí en Estados Unidos, fue este a través del son jarocho, um, que es de la comunidad de Veracruz. Uh, well, cuando yo aprendí el son, ja, son jarocho fue comunidades de, de José Luis Utrera uh, y su familia, este y los, la comunidad de Altepe y este ellos la banda venía con con otros como forma de resistencia no hablaban yeah. sobre lo que estaba pasando en su pueblo lo que está pasando con las minas con la política mm-hmm. con la deforestación y lo hacían a través de la música mm-hmm. eh, y yo me acuerdo que cuando aprendí sobre los corridos igual los corridos también era a través que era una forma de informar a la comunidad lo que estaba pasando a través de la música. Y creo que para mí fue, fue tan bello ver este, cómo la comunidad afromexicana en México, en Veracruz, usaba la jarana, el zapateado como resistencia. El, zapateado, el zapateo viene de raíces africanas, um, mm-hmm. con, por la colonización de España, este y también en el, a raíz de las comunidades indígenas de Veracruz. So, es una mezcla de eso, este, y el zapateo se ha visto como la resistencia, especialmente cuando antes los españoles miraban a la danza africana como, like, como diabólica, así como satánica, y eso era una forma de como, you know, el flamenco, como lo bailas, es como una forma de asimilar, ver, hacer que el español que nos estamos, se están asimilando, uh-huh. um, pero aún así están preservando su, su canto y su ritmo con el zapateo. And I thought that was really beautiful when I was hearing that from the community who was teaching us, like Linda and um, from Milwaukee, like yeah. el zapateo y la jarana. Y, este, y la jarana, a ver, como es una madera que ha sido como una réplica de la guitarra que mm-hmm. viene de, de un cedro del árbol de, proveniente de Veracruz que se ha usado para eso. And, and you, cuando yo escuché eso y compré mi primera jarana con la familia de José Luis, um, you can still smell el olor de cedro. And so, wow. even right now, si lo abro y lo huelo, you can smell el olor. And it's so beautiful uh, to see. Y luego el canto, el canto es como, habla de la resistencia. Uh, es una forma de cantar de amor, de resistencia, de lo que está pasando. 
eh, y también es como hacen fandangos, es como una forma de crear comunidad. ¿no? Cuando estás en un lugar como Wisconsin, que a veces no sientes que estás en comunidad, no perteneces yeah. y, y ver que hay un fandango y la, la comunidad trae comida, trae bebidas, trae este, música, y you're just cantas, bailas, mm -hmm. tocas, o you're just observing, but you're all participating. Todos For, están participando. Yeah. Yo, creo, yo creo que eso fue lo más bonito para mí y fue mi introducción con el movimiento, la música y, y aprender oh, un instrumento. Sí, ya. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Para mí era la primera vez uh, aprendiendo que resistencia puede ser con la música. Like I, when I thought of like growing up in the United States, in Milwaukee, like you think about protesting and you think about like these badass, like going out on the streets and marching and it, it is, but it also is about community and about love and <clears throat> being involved in Mecha and with the Son Jarocho that, you know, with the Fandangos that would happen, it was just like this beautiful space of community and healing that I never knew. And I'm forever thankful for that space because they brought, you know, that form of resistance and they taught it to us. And it was just very beautiful. Like I, like we, they taught us on how to show, they taught us like los, los cantos and los versos. And I was so self-conscious to be honest to sing. Um, even though I still did it, you know, I still did it. I was like, I'm, like, this is amazing. Uh, and at the same time, like I also observed and, um, but at the same time, like that mien, <clears throat> it, I felt Like, I also didn't want to appropriate it, porque that is de Veracruz, is like tradition for people. And so I just felt very grateful to have been welcomed in that space and to have been allowed to, you know, like play the son jarocho and, uh, no, son, yes, to play the harana, I mean, and to zapatear and to uh, like learn these things from people. Because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have known that like, resistance and protesting and like all of that is from love and from love okay. is how you create change okay. and from community too so yeah that's, y tú también bailas, no? yeah that, that's the thing though like yeah bailo pero y zapateo pero um como yo aprendí es like performative performative okay. dance mm -hmm. and people have like their own um It can be, ¿cómo se dice? Complicado, because there's like community dancing and dancing just for fun. And there's like performing. And some people see that as like, oh, like you're selling out, like you're, you're like, um, like you're getting paid to show off our culture. And there's like these very contradict, like these, it's very um, controversial, I would say, to mm -hmm. be in a ballet folklor folklorico company or like what I did. And I think that for, for a long time, for people who don't know, I was part, me and my sister grew up in Milwaukee and they had, bailamos ballet folklorico for like 10 years. And we were part of this company and we didn't get paid or anything. We just did it for fun, but we learned about like the dances, like where they come from, um, like how did they originate? Like we were, we didn't just dance and then perform and got paid. Like we actually learned about like, the violas, mm -hmm. like like the, tra the traditional dresses that people wear and like la musica, los instrumentos and stuff like that. But it's still like, it's still very controversial, especially being in a like very white place like Wisconsin and doing that. Um, so I feel like people have mixed feelings about that. Um, How was it for you, Michelle, when you did it? Like as you were learning it and like doing the, you know, I remember I saw you at Summerfest um, or not Summerfest. Uh, Mexican fiesta. fiesta Mexicana. Wow. Oh my Girl, God. I'm over here straight. thinking. Summer There's fest. a picture of you and your sister. So <sighs> beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. took pictures like, of y'all like... not knowing y'all. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it's funny. We, we learned about that years later, but I want to ask you like, how was that for you, Michelle? Because you said it was very controversial and people had a lot of mixed feelings about it. How did you feel? And what was that process like for you? I didn't learn about the whole controversial thing until I went to college. And when uh -huh. I learned about like people using music, like Son Jarocho as resistance, it's not a show. It's like a, a form of community, a form of resistance. Yep. And so um, in general, I didn't know that it was super controversial until I went to college and, you know, people had these different ideas. But yo, when I learned, I was in middle school, I was in high school uh, when I started dancing. I was in middle school and I did it all throughout high school and a little bit of college. 
But for me, it was more of a way to reconnect to who I was in my culture mm-hmm. because um, my mom in Mexico used to dance this, like we would do. So with the danza, we would do Mexica dancing, but also like ballet folklorico with the zapateados and like the different type of dresses that we would wear. So for me, it was empowering. I learned about my culture. I danced and I um, I loved it. I loved like my favorite noise is the zapateado, like having like some heels, like make a beat on the wood. Like that yeah. is my favorite feeling ever. Y también el, el, el tambor, like the drum from, from danza, that is so healing. So for me, like I love that. I still like if you put any song like I can dance to it like my body just still remembers everything so for me I love it I love dancing but yeah it can be controversial especially with certain people where they're just like you shouldn't be doing that and all these things and like I mean even in the dance community I don't think we really talk I think it'd be a different episode sorry but there's like dance communities um like of danza and of ballet folklorico especially in like the Midwest, all everybody knows each other. Like if you're in a group, mm. you know people from other states and you know the directors, you know like the teachers because mm. they're all so small and you know people from across the nation too. Um, because you all share this commonality. Right. Um, so that can be a little bit there, there can be some drama with that too, that we can talk about some other time. But um, <laughs> in general, I just went in there because I love to dance. I never got involved in the drama. I didn't care about like the politics of things. It was just like, this is part of my culture. This is part of who I am. I love right. it. I connect to my roots. Uh, I'm still going to do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that, yeah. It's like my happy place. It? It's what makes me heal. When's the last time you danced? Mm, it, it's been years. It's been oh, okay, years. it's been a while. But I still put it like so. I when I would study during law school, like I'd be jamming to like <laughs> to like like todo like yeah, for real. Yeah, yeah. And I would just like, yeah, I don't know. I I love it. It's something that I'll stick stick with me all the time. And yeah, you know, hopefully, um, pass it down to my kids if I have kids. Um, but yeah, That's it's good. something that I want to keep doing. Yeah. I know Cynthia also dance. She's like really smooth. She does like the shoulder thing where she's like, oh so my smooth. gosh. I know. So Maricela and I are working on this Gubia <laughs> choreography. <laughs> and we actually met up in Madison a few weeks ago outside at a park and just kind of like listened to the song together. We're like, okay, whatever comes to us. And then we started making this choreo. And yeah, uh, it was really cool bouncing ideas off of each other and like working together and, and working on this project together. And I'm actually excited to keep going with it. Um, but you're, you're teaching me some stuff. That's, it's really cool. <laughs> I need to see yeah. this when y'all have yes. it ready. We're going to post it on our Instagram and tag y'all. Yeah. I need to do it. It'll be and nice. it's, I think it was so beautiful because we, like you said, we were just bounce, bouncing ideas of each other. We were like, yeah. we put the music and she was no dancing pressure. her way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was dancing my way and then we're like, oh, it's going to look nice. And then, oh, I like that move. And it was just like, yeah. we're like grabbing from each other. So I think that was really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then so naturally fun. flows. Yeah. yeah yeah so yeah. stay tuned for that y'all <clears throat> and also i yeah. just to go off of like the whole controversy thing i just think anything in general that's choreographed is like there is a controversy over mm-hmm. that I mean, why are you choreographing it why are you doing this but at the same time it's just like it's just for fun you know it's not like i don't know i feel like certain people like I don't know if it's like people trying to do like trying to make something deeper than what it is but like y'all are just I don't know how to explain it. Do y'all know what I mean? It well, might make yeah. sense. And I think for me, when I, you know, like I'm not from Veracruz um, and I do play La Jarana, I always make sure that wherever I go, I talk about the community that I'm, yeah. who taught me about La Jarana mm-hmm. and like El Zapateado y el Los Versos because I feel like, especially coming from like indigenous communities, we're always like invisibilized. We're always like people, outsiders come and they take away and they profit out of it, right? And then, Aki, we're still struggling and the community is still struggling so that's why I, I make sure that like every time I do something that I use a jarana that you know it's, it's with con respeto it's yeah a, absolutely um that I'm conscious about it that it's like I don't appropriate or claim it as mine that I right. give credit to the community who taught me music and and I think that's how I picked up music I like I didn't just went to Veracruz and like I'm gonna play la jarana because 
I like it was like it was introduced to me mm-hmm. um I remember like Jorge um uh, Haro Chicanos were really like um supportive of like me picking up the instrument and learning it was like you should learn like um like and then it was like I know like um then they were like oh you should learn how to bailar and once I started getting into tarima oh maybe you want to do canto and so it was like for me, it was like the reason I picked it up was also because it was introduced and, and like, you know, it's como now como like an offering. And I thought that was just so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's why for me, it's really special. Like my first instrument that I bought was a harana and I carried it with me um, wherever I go. You say hiking or whatever, I would just take it with me just to play and like play to nature. Sometimes I would go to the lake and it toco el agua and like um, I try to do some versos and like cantar and like then I hear los pajaritos like you know, going around and it's so pretty. Cause I remember like we were at Mecha one day with Simon um, and Simon was playing the harana and de la nada los pajaritos llegan y se ponen en la pared y ahí se quedan. And like, I mean, en la ventana wow. and they're just like watching, you know? And I was just like, oh, it, it was just like so beautiful. Yeah. And like, you know, like, es el, como un canto. Um, y ya después, the birds know. For real. They know, nature knows. Yeah. yeah. Um, Y ya después de ahí, um, that was like my, yeah, I would consider that my first instrument that I picked up. Um, y ya después ahí empecé a bailar con las mujeres de Mosaico, que es un grupo de compañeras de afro, uh, afroperuana, um, una, otra, otras compañeras de Perú, que son de otra parte de la selva, de, um, I forget what the other compañera is, um, I think part of like the mountain area too. Um, and I saw one of the yeah. videos that you were in, I think it was good. Yeah. <laughs> I was so like, get I was, it. That's how I was introduced. And then also for me, bailar was so, like you, you talked about una forma like liberating, especially mm-hmm. when you come from like a religious background, like a Catholic, really happy. Um, sometimes, you know, like our bodies are viewed and treated certain ways. Y creo que con la danza, especially con mosaico, I was able to, you know, feel free in my body and like secure yeah. and confident and sexy and like powerful at the same time yeah so for me it was really it was really transformative and powerful and mm-hmm. i was also learning from the community in peru una compañera afro peruana she was talking about her struggles and her experiences and you know i didn't have to like go get a book or anything i was just listening to her story and that's how i'm learning about what's going on in peru mm-hmm. um and different perspectives and i think that has been really beautiful and then, um, and I, th- I think because of those experiences, it made me feel like, because antes I didn't feel like I was like a musician or I was like a, an artist in that way. But after those experiences, I'm just like, I, I really found myself in those yeah. spaces where I was like affirm, like, hey, you can also play an instrument. You can also sing, you can also dance. And, and I, I think because I was given that opportunity and like people were like super encouraging and like, no judgment and really believing in you like helped me a lot to be more like okay let me try it out and then then my dad plays the bass since he was like 25 26 years old um and seeing I grew up seeing him play like in California yeah. I would sleep under the table when those estaba tocando you know so my mom was with him um so I just I grew up seeing my dad in el pueblo se acostumbra que cuando hay alguien like someone passes away Llega, había antes había un señor que se había tocado la marimba. So that señor would come to a, a los funeral, a, el rosario, y tocaba la marimba, tocaba las canciones, luego llegaba la banda y tocaba las canciones, hacía los rosarios. So there was always music around, pero siempre dirigido por hombres, uh, más mm-hmm. que una más que una chica, porque su papá es el director de la, de la música, so she learned how to play, I think, el saxofón. Um, cool pero no es como algo como una carrera, ¿no? O las, las chavas que están en el coro de la iglesia que tocan la guitarra y like mm-hmm. that. Pero no es como like a career that you see yourself as a musician performing and going and, you know, doing the, going and tours and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, I never saw myself as like that, especially you see bandas and like um, mujeres who are, who are like white looking, white passing and, you know, mm-hmm. European features. So like yeah. you really don't see a lot of like indigenous looking communities um, making it. So that's why I love Mare Advertencia Lirica from Oaxaca, like mm-hmm. mad respect for her, like her music and her Lirica are dope. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just like really inspiring to see that. And I feel like there's people who I know know her and then 
there's other like you know I've been in digo environments that like have allowed me to experience this this emotions and for me now to be like oh I can do this I can be part of this and you know like in believing myself and as a musician um so yeah ahorita ya me da como más like confident I'm more confident in doing it and being like I'm gonna learn this and I wanna yeah. this is what I want to dedicate my 20s to music and you know really enhancing what I've learned so far like with the harana el zapateo el canto and then this day um connecting with my dad with the bass and I feel Ooh. like uh when Jose Luis talked about him being I think the fifth generation of like playing son jarocho right mm -hmm. so for me that's something that has been passed down to him and it's it's a form of resistencia and it's so beautiful and for our community like for my immediate family what has been passed around has been like our language como sembrar la tierra la milpa el frijol como ser tortilla mm -hmm. like that knowledge is has been passed through me and also my dad carries like el bajo and i want to you know have that be passed down to me so then yeah. i can like pass out to javi my sobrino or like other mujeres who want to learn and you know carry that como, like, and so that's how i got into the base was because of my dad um and and now and also the reason i want to get to the accordion as well eventually is because like my uncle he has an accordion and he like likes to play with it but nunca me dejaba tocarlo. Like, it wasn't like he didn't see me as like oh she wants to learn or she could learn right and for the first time he was like i was like can i see you me, me la prestas and he was like Orale, a, ver, a ver what you can do right and so me enseñó el, el escala do re mi fa sol um and then i was like playing it and i just remember the excitement of like el sonido que sale del acordeón yeah. and like and it's i was so like really cool. committed on learning yeah so then i was just like i want to learn this so then i was like awesome. that's how i got introduction an introduction to the accordion and i think a lot of the music that i like has an accordion and i think about corridos i think about like you know storytelling through music and i eventually want to get to that point of like you know storytell music resistencia que tenemos aquí en la comunidad de oaxaca and, and like mujeres and you know like uh, con cintia mm -hmm. and, el tambor, eh, la batería, sorry, la batería, and all this, so it's like, mm -hmm. it's really exciting to build connections with people through music. There's mm -hmm. something about music that, like, when you connect with someone with through music, it's a different way of connecting. It's like a different level, and it's very special, at least to me, I feel like it's very special. Like, I love when people send me songs or, like, yeah. it's really cool, Maricela. You sent me a whole bunch of stuff to check out. And I, checked, <laughs> I like, w watched all the videos that you sent me. I listened to all the songs. Like, for you to take time and, like, send me something. You thought of me in that moment. And you said, let me send this to Cynthia. Like, I don't know. It's just really cool to, like, to share that with one another, you know? And, like, I've always been, like... I, I love sharing music too when talking about it and it's just like a way of relating and connecting and having that shared experience and it's I don't know it's like a deeper level at least to me that's kind of how I see it so it's been really cool to connect with you in that way and like I don't know I, I just get I get excited talking to you about music because it, like I can just tell how much you love it too and like yeah. we're both like yeah we should do this and we should start a band and <laughs> like yeah like all these things and it's like really cool to like both be excited about it you know mm -hmm. and just share that so it, it's really cool and michelle you're gonna be our manager yeah yeah so are you both <laughs> so you you okay so maricela uh bass and accordion and maybe saxophone yes i saw so beautiful mm -hmm. and then so beautiful <laughs> cynthia drums piano Jones Anything and piano. else? Jones and piano. Okay. Well, I've yeah. always I've always loved the accordion, but it's expensive, so I have to figure out how to get it, how to get one. True. And so, la la so are y'all serious yeah. about you know making a band? Like, oh yeah, oh I am. I yes, I can I manage y'all. Yes. Can, I'll be down. I'll be down. So <laughs> look at your contracts. Like if if anyone yes. tries to oh my gosh, yes. gig, like have you perform somewhere. So, but yeah, even just to like it. jam like just do it for fun yeah like i just want to we don't have to like record anything or perform or anything but i just want to like jam together you know like that'd be so cool just to play music together yeah that would be so cool i always anhelaba ese um 
esas amistades we're just like we're in the garage together we're playing yeah. music and we're just like we're having bonfire and playing music or we're having a stay you know just like just having a space and, and bringing music you know and just um i think music has been so healing for a lot of us and i feel like mm -hmm. um when i think about comunidad i always think about music like there's always music involved and um and i just want i want like those friendships that where we can just like play music together and like express ourselves through music and mm -hmm. just sit down and play and jam and have a good time and connect with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah, stay. Yeah, como, like I've always had this belief like si, si pasa, like you know, que, like we end up becoming a, a band and then you know we're touring around, then beautiful walk, let's welcome it. Mm -hmm. Y si no, we're just like have fun and enjoy it. Like, you know, like, right. like yo creo que la música también es de toda la vida. ¿no? Es un momento. Oh, yeah. Like that's something that we're going to carry, carry it on. for years. Yeah. You're going to share our little ones, our older ones, our like, mm -hmm. friends, and it's always going to be there. And it's yeah. such a beautiful thing to, to know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's skill practice. Yeah. And it's beautiful. And, mm -hmm. and I I'm just want to hear like, Yeah. Like, and if we do end up going touring, girl, like, make it yeah. happen <laughs> i want to tour oaxaca like that for sure i want to go to pueblos mm, and yes. yeah. tour and play some music because there's some beautiful mu musicians down in oaxaca too and like dope musicians yeah. everywhere so there is, yeah so latino america we're we're out there <laughs> y'all heard it here first y'all can do yes. it i'm excited i part i know saying because now we're going to become expensive later <laughs> yeah. i agree <laughs> I international, that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to hear you. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm excited. I just really, just I know that we we have to like, and also we live in different states. Like I'm in Chicago, so you know, but it's it's not very far, so we can make it happen. You know, mm -hmm. we just I'm gonna get myself time. a base for my birthday, so then I can just go to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. my drums are portable. Like I can, I can also bring them over. So. Yeah, we'll make it work. We'll make it happen. But uh, yeah, I think it's super important that you, you know, you're sharing your passion and your love for music yeah. and that, you know, you're starting, you said you're going to dedicate your 20s to music yeah. and learning it and sharing it and building community with that. And I think it's important for our listeners también, to take that, you know, just because you're older it doesn't mean you know that mm. you can't try something right. new that you've always wanted to try or that like now that we're adults we have the resources to be able to put in money and time into these things that we've been wanting to but maybe haven't been able to when we were younger when we, when we didn't have those resources so I think it's important to it's important for you to have like shared that but it's also I hope people listening can feel inspired to maybe do something that they've always wanted to do mm -hmm. and didn't feel like they could and hopefully this inspires someone to do that yes a lot of power and even though like like for example like it was I didn't get into music because of like you know it's immediately through my dad it was mm -hmm. through the community so even if you don't have that support within your family at first like don't forget that there's community out there yeah that will be so down to support your dreams so mm -hmm. that's something to remember too yeah mm -hmm. thank you for being on thank you for giving yeah. me the space to share my story no Girl, yeah. you are welcome back anytime yeah. for real. <laughs> please come back we have a lot more to talk about for real yeah we okay. do <laughs> Yeah. well with that again thank you and thank you to our listeners we're gonna post that picture uh of maricela on our instagram and our facebook so and subscribe yep. to our youtube if you're watching this on youtube mm -hmm. comment and yeah hopefully in the future we will post a video maybe of them playing see no like a video of them dancing together what they were gonna do you know we're something's gonna be put out there if not a picture something 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 yeah we're young we still have <laughs> we still have a lot of life left we still oh, have yeah. Oh, things yeah. to do i'm excited thank yeah. you for being on <laughs> and i'm excited for us like i hopefully when covid and everything is not like a thing hopefully we can get together that would be really nice and like have my sister join. Ah, see, I um, love yeah. Jackie. Yeah, Jackie's cool. Shout out to Jackie. She's hey. been on the episode before. On the, I mean, on the podcast before. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and we'll catch you at the next one. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.